Yeah, so far I have two presentations. Okay, can I replace that one? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, just replace the darling. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a. Um, it's um so it's under presentations wherever that is yeah and it should be 10 26 UNC. yeah okay thank I just want to check to make sure everything looks right. <laughs> I have a bunch of skip slides, so I just want to make sure there's actually skips. Okay, that looks good. Okay, I think that's good. Thank you. No worries. And are you first or third? Okay. Yeah. Are you doing that? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. PM. Yes. Sorry, I have a seven thirty AM meeting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, when you said that, I was like. So much fun doing this together, and we had so many struggles, but we were still, you know, excited to be on the side of it and to keep. We we just have so much we can keep doing together. We're learning from each other. I hope this was a, a beautiful experience. For you. It was the first time. There's so many, so many first, yeah, big moments, and so it's just the beginning of like this whole stage of your career. I just can't be 10 years from now. She's going to be. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a nice time. Yeah. Let's all like. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I was like, team huddle. You need three more. Get some water. I don't think so. Let's do this. Yeah. Right. Where we go? Oh, it was so good. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I missed it. I had to go to a different, but. I'm glad you got to turn it on. Yeah, it was, it was the, I think I found the Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. I was Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be able to sleep again. I haven't slept in a week. Oh, my no, 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 no. She's not wrong, though. She's not wrong. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, hi. It's great. It's great. Oh, yeah. I think it's so much of women. I don't think about it. 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 A lot of work, and especially because not like animal beings, like you're know, sitting down on the ground, you're playing. Okay, so like, yeah, go for it. And then, stuff do right you mind? Can I delete? No, no, first plug it in, make yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, um, like, oh, cool. Like, my last session for a week. No. Do you want me to put this in here? Oh, um. Excellent question. Can I take a let me Let me see. Yeah. Or there's this also. See here, that's a US. Is it a regular USB? Yeah. I don't know. We can try. I am asking. That's why I'm really glad I was on time. This? 
Okay, no. Okay, let's, what's this? This has got to be it. We'll just plug it, make sure to plug it back in. That sounds good. This one. Let's open it and check. Good. Go do whatever you want. I just wanted to make sure that I had my notes in it. Okay, so I was oh, like, like down here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. So mm -hmm. if I want to be on presenters mode, is that Yeah, possible? so it should do it automatically. Let's okay. make sure. Oops. Yeah, so yeah. here okay. and here. Okay. Are you okay? Are, are I'm, moderating? I'm not moderating. Yes. Yeah, yeah. She's just switching her slides. Um, okay, so I'm going to delete the one that's in the folder. Okay. Yeah, I did. And I'm going to, oh, they already opened them. And then I'm going to just rename it. Yeah, yeah. Order. All right. People, and then open it. Okay. So, yeah, no problem. Um, now we'll unplug because I don't know what this thing is. So, yeah, we have to plug it back in. Yeah. Do you have a question about? Yeah. Do you my timekeeper? Yeah. Do you want to Oh, yeah, sure. Maybe for Yeah, the Yeah, Okay. Yep. And um, did you get your maybe get instructions from the Oh yeah, sure. Um, did you say, are you saying 12 minutes? Yeah. Okay. I will sit right here and give you a three, a one. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. I'm going to struggle with that. I will say Hanula. <laughs> Hanula. Okay. Uh, and then your last name? Kor. Yeah. Hanula Kor. Okay. Apologies with my American accent. Sorry. Uh, okay. Are your slides? Slides are now. Yes. You just check the sheet. Okay. Great. Um, two months ago. Oh, uh, okay. you have 12 minutes okay. to present. Yeah, we've just been so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna put time on here. So this video is front round. Um at so yeah, yeah, yeah. nine minutes yeah. he has eight more minutes left to sign. Eleven minutes should have one minute left to sign. When you get twelve minutes, put up the sign that says stop. That's the indication that you will be holding it. Because you need the extra new Yeah, yeah, because I didn't just know what anything was. Yeah, so it's just the most here. Oh, okay. He tried to hear and it's um, so, yeah, yeah, I'll just do it there. <laughs> You'll have roughly close to that. It just took me a little like process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, why are you doing that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to shred the Okay, thank you so much. Um, I don't know who Amanda is, but Megan is not in the room. Um, no, I'll just transfer it and give it back right back to you. That's okay. Um, so it's this one. Yeah. Okay, and I'm gonna rename it to be your name at the beginning. Just I don't know who's gonna be doing the switching. Um, what? Sorry, what is it? Sure. Have you checked your Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and I'm just gonna open it, and you can make sure that it's what you want. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, I'll keep it up. And um, I don't know if you have notes. Does it go on like but, um, It will go on. Okay. That's what I was going to say is like, I'll just show you. Um, okay. Here. Yeah. Um, and I will. Uh, so, I will get the part of the call and I three minutes and a one minute size. So, she'll hold up the three minutes when you get nine, and the one minute is the 11 minute part. When you put the email, then it marks you the sign that says stop. It don't necessarily need to have stop mid sentence, but that's your cue for yeah. um, consider that being up. Um, you'll have the remainder of your time up to 15 minutes. Uh, when you hit the 15 minute mark, I'll let you know. Please take one more question. At that point, I'll have to take next step to the side. So, our next presenter can come up and then load their slide while you take that last question. Exactly. I'm going to try to look through my slides. Really yeah, quick. please do just verify the slides. Going to okay. 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 And I, uh, yeah. my colleague will be close to this. I was like, maybe just. Okay. So, yeah. Um, Megan Lindmark, and then Amanda, Amanda Darling. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I did. I did. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, I just, I have a bunch of skip <laughs> slides and I want to make sure. Oh, that they skip. Yeah, I like to make the board where yeah, it's like it would be good to have an absolute. And this and it'll all be like loaded up. Sweet. This all I guess we're set up. 
and so I think, I mean, I'm actually, I think yeah, in the sunflower folder or like so in the internal ones that I can also just leave the flash drive here. Ah, yes. Um, I don't know which, what, drag it to the desktop and then I'll be sure that it ends up in the front. I already did it, but I didn't just take this one. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to this session. We are here in the Sunflower Room today. We, you are in the session for monitoring and evaluation. Uh, up first today, we have Sheila Sinharoy from Emory University presenting on the agency, resources, and institutional structures for sanitation-related empower, sanitation empowerment, ARISE, SCALES, a five-country validation study.
Thanks, Darcy. I know that was a mouthful. <laughs> um, but we're gonna we'll we'll explain uh, all of those words. So um, hi everyone. I'm Sheila Sinheroy, and um, I'm gonna start just by getting everyone on the same page about empowerment. The definition of empowerment. What are we talking about when we talk about measuring empowerment? So the definition that we use in our work is the expansion of choice and the strengthening of voice through the transformation of power relations so women and girls have more control over their lives and futures. And what you can see in the figure here is the conceptual framework that goes along with that definition where we have three domains of empowerment. In the middle, we have agency. On the left, we have resources. And on the right, we have institutional structures. So this is where the name of the tool comes from. Um, the agency resources, institutional structures for empowerment, for sanitation related empowerment scales. You can see that within each of these domains, there are, th there are several subdomains of empowerment, and that's what we're aiming to measure. But this uh, conceptual framework was developed to be applicable to any sector. And we wanted to operationalize this specifically for sanitation. So we went through a process that included a systematic review of the literature related to sanitation and empowerment and several other steps. But eventually we adapted um, the framework to still have the same three domains, many of the same subdomains, but we added a couple of things, um, including freedom of movement within agency, which we thought was important for women to be able to access sanitation privacy. Um, and so this is the this is the conceptual framework that we use in our work. Another definition that I wanted to touch on is the definition of validity, which the CDC defines as the degree to which an instrument measures what it is supposed to measure. This is really important when you are measuring something that is not directly observable. And so many of us will have seen a figure similar to this one where on the left we have um, an instrument that is reliable but not valid. And reliability is defined by the CDC as the degree to which an instrument can produce consistent results. So here on the far left, we have consistent results that are probably not what we intended to produce, right? So we have an instrument that is reliable but not valid. In the middle, we have an instrument that is neither reliable nor valid. We have no idea what we're gonna get here. And on the right, we have an instrument that is reliable and valid. So it's consistently producing the results that we intended to produce. And this is really what we are aiming for with our tools. And again, especially with an abstract concept like empowerment that is not directly observable, we can't just look at it the way we can you know, for sort of presence or absence of a latrine or a hand washing station. Um, we really need additional confidence to know that we are actually measuring what we say we're measuring. And so this is really, really important for any abstract concept, including empowerment. And so the goal of our study was to create and validate measures to assess women's sanitation related empowerment. This has been um, a multi-phase process that started five years ago in October, 2018. I'm not going to talk about all of the steps that we've gone through, um, but just going to focus today on phase three, which is the five country validation study of the tools that were developed over the course of these first two phases. And so what the study involved was data collection in five countries, eight cities across five countries. Um, the cities are shown here. So we have um, India and Bangladesh in South Asia, and then we have Senegal, Uganda, and Zambia in Africa. And in each city, women were randomly selected to participate in household surveys. So these are in-person household level surveys that included all 16 scales to measure the 16 subdomains of empowerment that we were trying to measure. Um, and of course the surveys included other modules like related to demographic characteristics, sanitation access and behaviors um, and some other, some additional measures that we added for validation. This all took place over about a year from mid 2021 to mid 2022. And we had over 6,000 women altogether in the study. 
So once we collected the data, the analysis has several steps. A validation uh, analysis has several steps. And so we started by randomly splitting our data into two separate data sets. So all of the 6,000 odd women were randomly assigned to be in either one or the other data set. And that way you have two independent samples that you can use for your analysis. And so we start with an exploratory factor analysis, which is designed to explore the data, to explore the, the structure of the data. You're looking for patterns in how the, the variables within each scale are correlated. And that will tell you about the, the, the structure, the concepts that are under the underlying concepts in your data. And so those patterns that you identify can then represent specific concepts that you are measuring. And so um, you look at which variables map, map onto those patterns, and then you can say, okay, these variables are measuring these concepts. You then move on to confirmatory factor analysis with the other data set, where you're confirming what you found in the exploratory factor analysis. So you're looking to see if the same patterns are present in this other data set. And if you are, then that gives you more confidence that these constructs are what you are measuring with your data. Then move on to multiple groups CFA, um, where you're looking across groups. In our case, the groups were the countries. So we have the five countries. And we're looking again to see if those same patterns that we identified are present in each of the country specific data sets. And that tells us whether we are measuring the same concepts in the same way in each group, in each country. So it's a, a, a very sort of systematic process where the data is telling you whether these, the, these same structures or these same concepts, these same factors exist in each, um, in each population. That's really the, the minimum when you're validating a scale. Um, this is something that you wanna look for in any scale that you're using, whether this type of validation has been done. We then also did, um, we used item response theory methods, which come from education, the education sector. So thinking of achievement tests, when you give kids standardized tests in a classroom where you're measuring their achievement, you wanna be able to measure all levels of achievement, right? From very low to very high. And so you want to know that your test is can measure all levels along that spectrum. And so that's what item response theory does. You already know from the factor analysis that you are measuring a construct, but you wanna know whether you're measuring all levels of that construct. And so you use item response theory for that. So that's what we did. And then we had additional validity uh, construct validity, external criterion validity, known groups validity, and reliability testing. So reliability is actually kind of the simplest, most straightforward thing to test for. Um, so we, we had the internal consistency and temporal reliability over time, where we're looking for consistency over time. We resampled um, a small proportion of the women and had two time points, so we could test for temporal reliability. So after all of that, obviously I can't go through the results for all 16 scales, but just to use decision-making as an example, um, our definition of decision-making is women's perceived ability to influence and make decisions about sanitation inside and outside the home. And so in our scale through this process, we ended up with five factors. So we, you know, through the factor analysis, we identified that there were five sort of patterns, five factors that were coming out in the data that measured individual aspects of decision-making. And so the first was ability to participate in household level decision-making. There were three items or three survey questions that kind of hung together for that. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, hopefully there's not an emergency. Um, so an example of one of those items was if my household was making a decision about sanitation related issues, I would be welcome to participate in the discussion. So just in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through um, the examples of each of the five factors, but altogether there are 13 items or 13 survey questions. 
that represent five sub constructs within decision making. And you can see um, going from left to right in these purple ovals, they go from household level to community level decision making. So we're um, within this decision making scale, we're capturing aspects of influence over decision making from the household to the community level with these 13 items. So altogether, we have 16 separate scales. The, um, the image here is showing the list of the scales and in the parentheses is the number of items in the scales. So it ranges from five to 21 items. Each of these scales can be used independently by itself um, off the shelf. So you can pick and choose which aspects of empowerment you want to measure, which subdomains you want to measure, um, and just measure those. You don't have to measure all 16 unless you really want to. Um, so, you know, if you just want to measure privacy, it's five questions and you're done. You can insert that into your survey and you can measure privacy related to sanitation. Um, we also have menstruation specific items that are available as optional add-ons. Obviously, those couldn't be part of the core survey, the core scales, because not all women menstruate, so we couldn't include them. Um, so they're so they are optional, but they're they are available and they have also been validated. So just in terms of next steps, we have um, we're doing validation of short forms. So for any scale, any of these scales that had more than 10 items, we developed a short form. So for all any of the 16 subdomains of empowerment, there will be an option that is 10 items or fewer to measure that subdomain. Um, that validation is just wrapping up. We are producing guidance documents and training materials for the scales, <coughs> sorry, for end users. And we're working on um, scaling up in new locations. So want to end with that, just thanking our funders, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, and the many, many organizations and individuals who have collaborated and contributed to this work. I'll start. Mm -hmm. uh, I can imagine that you might want to measure many of the domains at once, mm -hmm. in which case I didn't add up all your numbers, but you're looking at like 50 or 60 items, mm -hmm. I would guess. Do you have any plans to develop a short form that might encompass multiple domains at once? That's a that's a good question. We've talked about um whether it's possible to measure each domain so whether it's possible to measure agency and whether it's possible to measure resources <coughs> that would be i think that would be another another study another process um so the short answer is no at the moment not we want people to have the flexibility it was really important for us for people to have the flexibility to just be able to pick and choose what they want to measure for their programs or their research um so yeah that's that's how it's set up now Um, have any of the scales been used in like pre and post measurement or <laughs> intervention or um, something like that? And what is the sort of potential that you see um, for something like that? Like, do you think these scales would be sensitive enough to pick up on changes because of empowerment programming? Yeah, yeah, um, great question. Yes. Um, we are excited because the Gates Foundation has just funded a project that will be including these some of these measures in their baseline assessment of an urban sanitation project intervention. Um, and so that'll be the first time that it's been used in a in you know a program evaluation. Um, but that is the intention. And we've we've done um, we've looked at longitudinal invariance, which is another, important part of validation to be able to say that you're measuring the same thing at different times. Um, and the, the intention is to, to be sure, to have confidence that 
when you're measuring these concepts at different times that you're actually picking up changes, that it's not the tool that is, you know, leading to observe changes, it's actually changes in empowerment. And so, yeah, that was, that is the intention to be able to use it at multiple time points to evaluate programs. We have time for about one more question. I think I saw it here. Um, so for the most recent specific items, um, how does that work? Like, are they items that we would that kind of like go into each domain, or is it like its own domain? Or there are menstruation specific items, not for every subdomain, but for many of them, and um, they would be scored separately. Yeah. Great. Thank you again, okay. Sheila. Great. Up next, we have Megan Lindmark and Wes Meyer from EOS International presenting on sensor-based monitoring for improved circuit rider management of chlorinated pipe schemes in Central America. Awesome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm Wes Meyer, and this is Dr. Megan Lindmark. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about our sensor monitoring program and some of the learnings and findings along the way. So EOS, we provide post-construction support to rural communities across Central America, specifically Nicaragua, Honduras, and El Salvador. And we do this through our circuit rider model. So we're working with a, a community-based model uh, where the communities have water boards established and we're providing services to improve the capacity of these water board. Uh, we have six basic uh, services that we're offering, starting off with water quality analysis, analysis or water quality testing. Um, Capacity building, so building the capacity of the community water boards to operate their water uh, operate as an efficient water utility. Um, water treatment through an inline water chlorinator. Um, this is typically installed above the tank and using chlorine tablets to dose chlorine into the inline community water source. We also provide uh, chlorine distribution. So across the 2000 rural communities that we're working in, um, we set up a series of about 60 chlorine banks or distribution centers to then resell chlorine to the, to the last mile communities. So the communities have a continual source of chlorine. Finally, uh, looking at technical assistance. So helping uh, when things break or other harder, more technical components of the water system, um, working with the communities to do that. And then finishing with our water quality monitoring and kind of where we're at today. Um, talking about with a remote sensing. So our water quality monitoring program includes our circuit riders visiting these communities on a monthly or sometimes quarterly basis and doing routine water quality checks, uh, specifically checking for chlorine residual. And we check the uh, chlorine residual on a surprise visit in various parts throughout the community. And we log it into our um, online database using mWater. Um, you can see kind of on average across the last 10 thousand community visits. So again, our model is about going out and working with these communities and continually visiting. So our monitoring data indicates two critical results. First, uh, looking at lapses in chlorination, which are driven by an operator error. Again, the community member themselves are putting chlorine in their chlorine tank. So looking at the operator error, the community operator error, um, the part of the community water board. Um, but secondly, sustained effectiveness of chlorinators. And so we're measuring free chlorine residual above 0.2 milligrams per liter. Um, uh, which is positively associated with the frequency of the technical assistance visited visits by our circuit writers or water technicians. So research objectives that we looked at first is to develop a surrogate sensor approach for classifying the low free chlorine residual. Um, but secondly, creating a sensor triggered SMS alert um, to alert if there's a low chlorine measurement. So now Megan's going to dive into the specifics of the project and where we've gotten. It's pretty exciting. So thanks, Wes. Um... Like Wes was saying, uh, it, we, one of the main research objectives today that we're going to discuss is, is
use a sensor directly. Uh, these sensors are often very, very pricey, uh, prohibitively so, and um, are also not really built to be placed into a rural tank um, in a community and left and forgotten about. So uh, on the other hand, manual testing is very affordable. However, it requires labor of our circuit riders and consistent visits, and you only have one specific sample in time. So instead of that, we're considering an approach and, and um, the research that we're sharing today is around this approach of using oxidation reduction potential coupled with pH, um, which we'll get into a little bit more, um, as in addition to tank level sensors uh, to monitor uh, the water quality at these tanks as well as the water quantity. So we've proven in our first phase of our pilot um, that these this sensor setup that I'm describing here uh, it works and does what we expect it to do. So the second phase of our pilot, uh, um, and this is kind of an example setup at one of our tanks. So that that's the chlorinator that Wes was describing, um, and then this is the placement of tanks or excuse me tank level sensor as well as water chemical sensors, um, and then a data logger. And what's not shown is a solar panel and battery that allows all of this to operate in these rural communities. So our pilot phase was to implement these systems into four communities in rural Honduras um, and then pair the uh, sensor collected data with manual free chlorine residual measurements four times a week per site over the course of six months. So then the question becomes with all of this data, how can we translate ORP and pH sensor data into useful free chlorine residual estimates? So I don't, I don't want to bog you down with the, the data science methodology of developing these models, so, so I'll keep it very brief, um, but we, we took all of these coupled measurements of ORP, pH, and free chlorine residual, split those into paired training and test data sets, so 80% of the data was used for training, 20% for testing. Um, and we used these training data sets to refit a regression model uh, that was previously developed um, and refit the coefficients of that model for each one of the sites we installed this at. So using those models, then we uh, applied the 20% of data that we saved to test how effectively the models work um, to determine how often our model can correctly predict when there might be a lapse in chlorination based off of those sensor data points. So uh, just to, to clarify kind of the, the data that I'm about to describe to you, we, we consider a, a positive in this case as a low free chlorine event. So that's the type of event that we want to detect with our model. So what I'm describing here is a, a low free chlorine event is any time that free chlorine residual is less than 0.5 milligrams per liter. And a negative is any time that the free chlorine residual is above that, so it's adequate chlorine. So we want our model to be able to properly detect these low free chlorine events, these positive events. And the accuracy of our model um, with regards to this is one example community um, was 89%. So 89% of the data points that the model had not previously been trained on was able to accurately determine whether or not it was a low or a high free chlorine residual event. Um, and I'll also point out the true positive rate. So all of all of the actual low free chlorine events, our model was able to correctly identify 99% of those events with ORP and pH data alone. So rather than just show you numbers, I'm gonna show you a time series data set of that actual ORP sensor data. So uh, over here, you can see the ORP is this black line across a two month period after our experimental period. Um, and the red shaded bars show events that were classified as low free chlorine residual events per our model. These dashed lines then represent actual grab samples collected by our circuit riders on a routine basis. So you can see by these green dashed lines are actual confirmed events in which free chlorine residual was sufficient or adequate. And the red dashed lines represent events in which there was actual low free chlorine residual. So you can see over this two month period, the five grab samples are all confirmed by estimates made by the model. So the next step is then how can we actually apply this model, right? How can we use this model to reduce the duration of those lapses in chlorination you could see, and then improve the proportion of time that chlorinators deliver sufficiently chlorinated water to the communities in which our circuit riders work. And perhaps even more importantly, how can we optimize our circuit riders uh, time? So. Uh, Back 
up to safe standards. So in the last month, we've begun to actually convert these, uh, this model into text message based alerts for our technicians. Um, so what I'm showing you now is a very similar time series data set. However, it is pre and post the implementation of these text message alerts. Uh, so the shaded bars might be a little bit tricky to see, but the, the darker red bars are, are predicted instances in which there is low chlorine and the green or, or unshaded sections are uh, instances in which chlorine is sufficient and adequate. So the first three weeks of this time series data is before text messages uh, began to be transmitted to communities or to technicians and then post. So what we can see somewhat visually, but it's helpful to have the numbers assigned is that in the first three weeks prior to the text messages, 67% of the time there was adequate chlorine in the water. In the following three weeks, after technicians began to receive text messages, that rate was up to 84% of the time they had access to safely chlorinated water. And so there were three low chlorine events during the initial period. Um, and there were actually more low free chlorine events during the second period, but on average, they were much shorter, uh, 69 hours in the first period compared to 13 and a half hours in the second period. So, so what this indicates to us, and I should emphasize that these are very preliminary results, as you can see, this data set ends nearly days ago. So this is very early data, but what it's suggesting to us is that our technicians are able to quickly respond to lapses in chlorination and provide resolution to that community and bring them up to safe uh, levels of drinking water much more quickly than they might be able to without these alerts. So I'll dive in very briefly to kind of end us out here to one of those specific instances of low free chlorine. Um, and our technician actually received these exact alerts that indicated that there was low free chlorine residual in the community. Um, and then we received these WhatsApp messages from O'Brien, our technician, to confirm that there was in fact no chlorine in the community uh, or in the water in the community. And Brian worked with the water board to establish why that was. They determined that they had not yet purchased chlorine uh, for that month. And so they had run out of their supply and they needed to purchase more. They promptly purchased more at the end of the day on the 17th. Um, and then you can see chlorine levels return to what they would be uh, expected to be. So I'll end um, kind of with this summary that sensor triggered real time alerts correctly predict lapses in chlorination and can result in technician-mediated behavioral response. Um, going forward, we need to continue this work, right? We need to determine what are the factors necessary to actually enable technicians to respond to these text messages, as well as what would it would look like to put the text messages directly in the hands of those community water board members who are ultimately the ones that have to make the decisions. Um, and we also wanna to continue to explore less data-intensive alert algorithms. So I have a couple of quick acknowledgements. A lot of this work was done while I was still at the University of Iowa. So I wanna thank the University of Iowa team and it was also funded by Xylem um, and they provided sensors for this pilot study. Um, perhaps most importantly, the team on the ground at EOS, uh, both Deanna and Brian were critical for the, for the work that we presented here today. So I think we'll take any questions at this point. Yes, Amy. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a good question. So, point five was established because we're also sensing at the tank and knowing that it needs to feed an entire distribution system. We actually probably would want it to be a fair amount higher than point five at the tank. So, point five was the threshold picked for that reason. Um, we haven't tested what the performance would be at a lower level. We expect it would be a little bit harder to determine just because the, the lower you get, the, the closer you are to zero. And there, there's just like, we, we don't expect the relationship to be nearly as high performing at that rate, but it's something we would like to explore further. Yes. Um, I'm not questioning the value of knowing sooner and it's been like, Fixing it sooner and it's been tough that it's been taking up time, but I am wondering about any concern or how you're looking at a huge increase in workload for your technicians and how we can plan for that in a 
Sure. Yeah. No, it's a really good question. I think I think two things. One, the hope would be that this is alleviating some pressure on the technicians to visit tech communities that might not need to be visited in that instance. Uh, the other thing, though, is the goal really is to put these alerts into the hand of the community water board managers. So the, the main reason that there would not be chlorine in the water is that they had forgotten to replace the chlorine tablet. Um, which is which is super common in some instances because the tank is you know a, several kilometers away. Like of course they don't. It's a lot of effort to require them to go up and check on a regular basis. So hopefully this actually alleviates stress for them long term. But that's the next step. For now we don't want to send false alerts to uh, community members. So yeah. yes. Great. Really cool. I'm assuming that October 19th is this. Okay. Yes. Right, so yeah. My question to you is, how long do you think these sensors are going to last sure. in that approach? And you know, chlorine is corrosive and it's in the tank and all. Um, so, great design. I'm just curious to how you see that. When are you going to know when they don't work? Yes, that, that's a really good question. And so this sensor um, the, of the community that we were showing has been installed for two years now, and so is still performing as well as we would expect it to be. Um, and that is kind of a next step for us, though, is to to start to determine, you know, what is the lifespan of this kind of sensing work. Um, I don't I don't have a good answer for you other than so far so good, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's uh, that's the the immediate uh, answer. But we we actually yeah, did so. start with also pH probe um, that did mm -hmm. fry out pretty quickly within a couple months of yeah. use, and so that's why just using ORP, we're realizing that we we don't necessarily need to have the pH. Um, and so, yeah, the whole point of this test, you know, is really look now looking at the longevity, the types of sensors, um, you know, Xylem is a pretty high quality sensor, generally speaking, um, and higher costs. So yeah. if we can uh, get a, a slightly lower cost, um, but understanding what the, what the reliability is of those. Are these data going to be in the publishing pipeline of the peer review system? That's, that's the, that's the plan. Yes. Yeah. Same. Um, knowing that it's perhaps unlikely with the, this type of chlorine, but would the system have the ability to detect excessive levels of chlorine as well? See that out just the ORP data? Sure. Yeah. So it, theoretically, like Amy was asking, you could set a threshold lower than 0.5. You could also set a threshold higher than 0.5, right? So you could imagine kind of a two pronged alert where it might alert you if the um, ORP or if the predicted free chlorine is above a certain threshold as well. Um, it's not something we've specifically explored, but in the same way that you could set another threshold, you could do that if you knew what the threshold you wanted to test was. The, the design of our water systems, it's hard to over chlorinate just with the, the system that is the way it's set up. Great. Cheers. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Up next, we have Amanda Darling from Virginia Tech University presenting uh, sub sewer shed wastewater surveillance in rural Appalachia reveals influence of inflow and infiltration from enteropathogen signal. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Amanda. I'm currently in my fifth year at Virginia Tech. Today, I'm going to be talking about our work on a sub sewer shed surveillance project where we're looking at impacts of inflow and infiltration, otherwise known as INI on detection and concentrations of pathogens. So as a lot of us in this room know, wastewater-based surveillance has shown to be a really promising public health monitoring tool, both in light of COVID-19 and now moving on to other infectious disease targets. So much so that the CDC has established a national wastewater surveillance system, also known as NEWS, in many parts of the country. However, for this system and many other systems in the US, rural areas are generally less rep represented for a number of reasons. However, wastewater-based surveillance is arguably very important for rural parts of the country because these are the pockets of the country where we have the least access to primary care. There's less local doctors, longer travel distances to healthcare. So, um, all of these factors impact our ability to detect, prevent, and treat infectious diseases for these pockets of the country. And that's why wastewater-based surveillance can be so useful for these parts of the country, 
because we could be able to better provide population level estimates of an infectious disease burden where we have limited cl clinical testing data. However, there are a number of special considerations when you're trying to do wastewater surveillance in rural systems. For one, there's less geographic density, so this leads to longer per capita distances of sewer pipes, despite lower tax bases to be able to support them. So all this leads to relatively underfunded municipalities, there's less O&M, less updated infrastructure, and all this is exacerbated by population decline. And all of these factors also happen to contribute to a growing issue in the field of wastewater surveillance, which is inflow and infiltration, also known as INI. And basically, this is where you just have unwanted stormwater or groundwater getting into your sewer system at unknown rates. And so why is this important for what we're interested in looking at in our sewer system? Well, when we have unwanted groundwater and surface water getting into our system, this impacts the sample matrix we're interested in uh, when we're doing wastewater-based surveillance. So um, we don't know how this impacts our false positive and false negative detection rate and how it could potentially increase uncertainty for parsing out true infection in a community from our wastewater samples. Okay, so now I'm gonna be talking about the specific sewer shed I'm working in. So the wastewater treatment plant was designed as a 0.5 million gallon per day plant, but currently operates at around three times that capacity due to all the I and I in the system. There's also a number of interceptor manholes located under the river for a substantial part of the year. These are all pictures I've taken in the field and it's a very low population size around 2,500 people. And so our sampling design was to collect monthly samples for a course of the year. We just finished up this past August and we're processing samples for three separate workflows. First, we wanted to use a high throughput qPCR approach known as Tacman array cards to identify um, detection across the sewer shed um, for a number of different pathogens. And then um, once we knew what was in the sewer shed using this high throughput approach, we wanted to narrow down our targets um, using a more sensitive and specific method. So we we're using digital droplet PCR and we also wanted to quantify uh, human fecal markers in the system. And lastly, uh, we we're also quantifying indicators of I and I. So this is a map of our sewer collection system. It's important to note that for most wastewater sampling designs, you're only really taking samples from the wastewater treatment plant. So we are really interested in seeing what's happening upstream as well that could potentially impact detection. Um, the numbers that are shown in each of the sampling nodes represents the estimated number of people that live upstream. So we are kind of, we're getting a better idea of catchment size. So to first better understand I and I across our system, we wanted to leverage our physical chemical data. So here I'm showing chemical oxygen demand, which can be used as an indicator of how strong the wastewater is. And what we saw was that where we knew there were hot spots of I and I, such as the interceptor that's under the river for a good part of the year. Um, that it had a lot lower levels of COD than typical concentrated wastewater. And along this branch line where we don't have lots of I and I impacts, we can see normal levels of COD for concentrated wastewater around 500 milligrams per liter. And what was interesting was that we saw this pattern was true um, where we had I and I hotspots that were pretty diluted even during dry weather periods. And so, in February, we had a sampling day where we didn't have rain on the day of sampling as well as the previous seven days. And we still saw the same really low levels of COD where we knew there were issues with I and I. And so when we compare COD on dry versus wet weather days, um, this is our site that's not I and I impacted. And we have pretty high levels of COD around 500 milligrams per liter um, across these types of weather. And then what was interesting was um, some of our other sampling points, which we knew were I and I impacted. Um, even during dry and wet weather periods, we had really low levels of COD. 
So we think there's something going on there. Maybe um, since it's so close to the creek, the soil is really saturated with groundwater year round. Uh, okay, so next I wanna talk about our detection with our TAC array card data. So overall, what was promising was that we saw detection was pretty consistent at the influent for a variety of pathogens on the TAC array card. If we are detecting something upstream, we are normally detecting it at the influent. However, this varied by pathogen target. So for our Salmonella species assay, we were consistently detecting it upstream at two of our locations, but never detected it at the influent. And now moving on to digital droplet PCR data, here I'm gonna be showing data for rotavirus and craspage. So first to better understand detection, we wanted to look at the detection rates. Um, so in green, you can see the detection at our wastewater treatment plant influent. And it was really promising that we saw 100% detection for rotavirus, which is pretty ubiquitous in wastewater um, on all of our, sample, our 12 sampling months. And then I'm also showing detection rates for uh, different levels of COD across sites, decreasing by level of COD. And what we see is that detection decreased with our lower levels of COD. And now zooming into our instances of non-detects, we can see that we have the greatest percent of non-detects at our lowest levels of COD sites, which are indicators of dilution. Um, and we also see shown by the more translucent color that um, wet weather sampling events contributed more to our percentage of non-detects. And now we wanted to use these same categories to look at our actual concentrations with our digital droplet PCR data. So what was promising was we also saw the highest concentration at the wastewater treatment plant influent, despite all of the INI that we knew was upstream. Um, and then we also saw decreasing levels of rotavirus with decreasing levels of average COD. And it's been suggested in the literature that adding a normalization factor such as crassphage or um, human mitochondrial DNA can account for suggested dilution. So that's what I'm showing here. Yet we still see the same patterns where um, concentrations decrease with decreasing levels of COD. So that was a lot of data, um, but just some ending conclusions that I want to end on. Overall, INI is a really important factor to consider, especially when you're applying wastewater-based surveillance in rural areas. And maybe you need to better understand what's happening upstream before um, drawing conclusions from the wastewater treatment plant influence and also um, targeting your method because of this. And also we found that it was important that we are seeing I and I impacts during dry weather periods. So if you're thinking you're avoiding um, I and I impacts during wet weather periods, maybe you need to, or maybe we can target our sampling strategy better. We also want to dig more into normalization methods. And overall, we saw it was really promising that we are getting really good detection at the treatment plant, um, despite all the I and I in our system. And for future directions, we use rotavirus, but I would really like to use some more variable targets such as RSV or hepatitis A that aren't as ubiquitous in wastewater. And we'll also be partnering with our state health department to um, see if we can pair our wastewater data with clinical data. And lastly, I want to thank all of our funders, collaborators and team. This takes a huge amount of work to put on every month. And I also wanna provide my contact info in case you have any follow-up questions. And now I'll take any questions. I didn't see whose hand went up first. Okay. Amy, did you have a question? Well, 
I'm very curious about your past data and how people feel. Yeah, I have a slide that I can pull up if I can find it, but your normalization question, we didn't collect data on pepper mild model virus. We still have extract left, so I'm sure we could add that on, but we're also um, looking at HF183 and the human mitochondrial DNA assay that Joe Brown's group worked on. Um, so we have data for that. I was just only showing uh, cross phage for the purpose of this presentation, but we also have all of our total suspended solids, chemical oxygen demand data as well. So, and flow data coming into the plant. So the hope is to explore different normalization factors as well and see if one introduces different trends than the other. Um, but yeah, I, I think we really wanted to see if it would account for dilution and it's unclear. Um, right now. And then your other question was, let me see if I can find the slide. I have some skip slides, but I'm not sure how to show it on here. But um, basically, so we have a rotavirus assay on the Tacman array card, and it did seem like the DDPCR was more sensitive in being able to pick up concentration, like lower concentrations across the sewer shed compared to the Tacman array card data. We were only doing the Tacman array card for four months, not the full 12 months. So um, yeah, I'm looking into looking forward to digging into that further. But yeah, it seems like the digital droplet PCR is a little bit more sensitive. Yeah. And did you have a question? So I think you mentioned that there were a couple of instances where you detected pathogens at upstream sites, but not at the sensors. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so I haven't dug that much into the specific concentrations for the digital droplet PCR data, but I know we had instances of detecting norovirus and salmonella upstream, but not at the plant. And I'm not as confident with the concentration estimates for the TAC uh data versus the digital droplet pcr data um we were really just using the tac for detection mostly to get that confidence there um but i can get back to you on that too <laughs> yeah, I have one. so you use crv as a surrogate for infiltration and it's a good good idea but do you measure flow rate at, at points in your system we, so some of our composite samplers had an option to do flow-based composite sampling. So we have an idea of flow at some sites. And then I really wish I could show more of my slides, um, but the treatment plant actually did some flow monitoring at different points in the system. So we could see, so we have confidence um, for some sites that there's clearly infiltration happening, that's precipitation induced, not just, you know, it's close to a creek, it's getting groundwater year round. Um, but we also have a lot of nutrients. So we have total phosphorus data. Um, uh, we don't have full scale flow monitoring data just because that would be really, I think that would have been an even more complicated part of this project. But it is a good question. And I can show you that flow data also. Did you use ISCO samplers? Yeah, so we used ISCO samplers and then the flow monitor that the treatment operators were using to detect flow throughout different parts of the system was a Hawk uh, flow meter. But yeah, ISCO samplers. Did anyone mess with your ISCO samplers or steal them or anything? They they <laughs> didn't. I'm afraid to put something that expensive out there. Yeah, we were scared too because um, it was monthly sampling and it was three hours away. And we developed a method of there's septic risers that we kind of hit them under for some of the shallower manholes. But a lot of the ISCO samplers, if, you're, um, if your sewer is deep enough, you can hang them in the sewer. Um, so they're pretty safe there. That's true. I didn't know you like put a bush over here. Yeah, we we put tarps over a lot of. Yeah.
Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so that's really cool data, especially in rural and, and putting this all together. Uh, this, my question for you on like the utility, if they have a manhole under a creek, are they able to do something that we don't maybe need a bunch of evidence for that that might be a problem? Or is there, you know, I'm just, I, I'm with you on this, but it's also how do we move forward with our utility part in society? <laughs> yeah, I think this is a really I and I in news and filtration. There's a cost to the plant and there's a challenge. Yeah, I can't speak to if this is a system that's very common compared to other systems. Um throughout the US in general, it seems like this system is pretty extreme and it's it was built a long time ago. And it's interesting the way they designed it. It's mostly because of how gravity flows, but also there is a river over. The manhole, so it it doesn't make that much sense. They did just get a really large grant to move it out of the river, so so I think the issue is that utilities kind of know where the problems are. It's just a matter of money. Um, but yeah, it's a really good question. Great, yeah. Great, thank you. Our final presenter for this slot is Hanur Kua with the water project presenting on multiple water source use in Western Kenya schools. Um, hi everyone, um, I'm Harnoor Kaur. I'm the monitoring and evaluation associate at the water project. And I'm very excited to share findings from a research study that we did last year to explore how schools are using multiple sources and how do they cope up, what coping mechanisms they're using to deal with water insecurity. Um, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, so before I delve into that, I just want to talk about the Water Project. So the Water Project is a nonprofit that's based in New Hampshire. And our mission is very clear and resolute. We want to provide reliable water access to communities. And we want to do it in a way that's that meets the need of those communities. So um, we work in three different sub-Saharan countries, uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Sierra Leone. But the focus of this presentation is on our Western Kenya WASH program. Um, in specifically in Western Kenya, we focus on two counties, Kakamega and Vahiga. And we try to implement a lot of different types of water point types, keeping in mind the requirements of a, the communities and schools. So we do rainwater harvesting tanks, boreholes, hand dug wells, and protected springs. Um, so, um, so now let's talk about like, why did we decide to do this study? Um, so this study was definitely a crucial part of our commitment to ensure that we are improving water access and coverage for communities in the in the region. Um, we identified that ensuring year-round reliable access to drinking water for Western Kenya School was a persistent challenge, and that was based on our uh, quarterly monitoring data that we have been collecting for the past few years, and also based on this. Mobi water sensors that we have installed on our rain, rainwater tanks. So these Mobi water sensors are able to detect the volume. Um, and based on that, we were able to see that there were certain periods during the year when schools did not have access to tank water, which led us to the hypothesis that they might be using alternative sources to supplement their needs, which is why we decided that we want to study these schools and understand what kind of sources they're using and also determine the factors that influence them to use these alternative sources. Um, so to just give you a background about the study area, um, the water project has installed 388 rainwater harvesting tank systems in Vahiga and Kakamega. 70 of them have movie water sensors. And um, the idea that we had was, oh, the idea was, um, Sorry, and we decided that we want to do, um, we want to focus on these schools. Um, so the selection criteria for our study was 
to uh, any school that had a TWP funded 50,000 liter or 75,000 liter tank installed in either Vahiga County or Kakamega County. And second, it was important for us to have the Mobi water sensors installed on them so that we could keep track of the volumes as we were doing data collection in those areas. Um, so just to get, just to go briefly over the methodology of our study, we adopted a concurrent mixed method approach. Uh, we did qualitative, for qualitative methods, we did focus group discussions and key informant interviews with school staff. And most of our questions focus on water quality, water access, and also their perceptions about how they use these sources. And then for quantitative methods, we worked with the focus group participants to identify an inventory of all the sources that they're using, and also ask them to rank these uh, water sources based on their based on aspects such as availability, access, quality of water. Um, so the products in the end was that we got 15 focus group discussions and key informant interview transcripts, and we also got a water source inventory and management survey. And in the end, we were able to merge this data and develop more findings um, that I'll be talking about next. Um, so the first finding um, was that when we asked the school staff to identify all of the sources that they're using throughout the year, we found that they're using a lot more sources than we had initially expected. Overall, uh, there were more um, off-premise sources than on-premise sources uh, that the, these schools were using. We also identified that um, most of the sources that were um, that these schools were using that were unprotected were off-premise as compared to the sources that were protected that were available on ground. Uh, we identified that the schools were using on average eight different sources with a minimum of six and a maximum of 10. And uh, the average time that these schools were spending on collecting water from off-premise sources were 33 minutes. So that's time that's being spent away from school collecting water and you're not, you don't get the opportunity to study or play at the school. And that was one of the complaints of the participants in the focus group discussion as well. Um, but now let's move and talk a little bit more about the role of seasonality. And I believe that was like our second most significant finding from the study is that seasonality, seasonality can definitely play a big role in how schools choose these sources and why do they prioritize off-premise sources during certain times of the year. Uh, so we identified that 70% um, of the sources that schools use during the rainy season are on-premise. And the reason for that is majority of these sources are rain-fed sources, which means that when there's no rain, the, the schools don't have access to these sources anymore. So while the schools are set for the rainy season, the dry season looks completely different. And it means that schools have to go outside of their premise and collect water from off campus or uh, unprotected sources during the dry season. Um, which means, this finding was really helpful because it also helped us look into the coping mechanism these schools are using to ensure that they can get water during periods when they, when there's not enough water available on premise. Um, so first thing that they've been, first coping mechanism that they've been using is that they're relying on multiple water sources, but definitely sources that even they don't know where the water is coming from. So schools uh, ask students to bring water from home, and we identified that 10 out of the 15 schools that we went to required students to bring water from home during the dry season. And that extended to 12 schools, which uh, two other schools that required uh, students to bring water year around, which means that these schools were not that com confident in that the water that they had on ground could uh, sustain the needs of the students and the staff members. Second, um, School uh, students and sorry, schools allocate different water sources to different uses. Um, so if schools allocate sources that they perceive as protected for drinking and cooking, per uh, cooking purposes and anything that they perceive is not protected is used for purposes like cleaning, agriculture or gardening activities. Um, and the third thing, third coping mechanism that these schools have been using is rationing and restricting use for students and community members. So it's not only about doing what periods you get to ration like the water, it's also about who's asking you to use that water and they ration that their use based on who's asking it and when. 
Um, so these um, school uh, officials uh, usually ask community members to restrict their limit to maybe like 40 liters a day or 20 liters a day so that there's enough water left in the tank for the students to use. Similarly, they usually close out the taps during the break time or after school so that um, nobody else is using those tanks or wasting the water from uh, the tanks or other sources that they have available on ground. Um, so I believe these practices really showcase, you know, the different ways these schools are handling the water that's available on ground, but also highlights that um, they'll do anything to make sure that students on ground have water. And that could often mean that they would use multiple water sources. Um, I think, and, and this definitely has some takeaways for the watch stakeholders. The first being that, um, Using this data and looking at the variability, um, seasonal variability, we realized that these schools are shifting between limited and basic access based on what time of the year you're actually going there and interviewing them about what sources they're using. Um, and this is something that's not well captured in the JMP ladder, but that means that we need to look closely at the data we're collecting and, and making sure that um, we capture this temporal variability um, while installing new water points at schools and especially installing rainwater harvesting tank systems. Second, um, mixings of, mixing of different sources, protected and unprotected, can negate the gains of using protected sources, um, which, which was a good finding for us as an organization as well. And then the third was finding was, um, takeaway is enhancing school resilience. I do believe that this is a positive point um, that, um, that schools are enhancing their resilience to um, challenges like infrastructure challenges or contamination issues by relying on different sources. So if they do not have access to one water point, it doesn't necessarily mean that schools are going without water the entire day. It means that they're just leveraging multiple sources, sometimes unprotected as well, but they're ensuring that school students have access to drinking water. Um, and we as an organization definitely learned a lot from this study. Uh, but these are some of the key takeaways that we took, uh, that we are trying, um, we're going to use to make programmatic changes. The first, we realized that sampling water directly at the rainwater tank might not give us the entire picture of the quality of water that the students are drinking, because students are definitely using water from a lot of different sources. And it's also possible that students are bringing that water and putting that in the tank itself. So, uh, so that doesn't necessarily tell us the quality of water these students are having. So maybe we should change the way they were sampling water um, in our schools and also shift the way that we do treatment. Uh, we're thinking of shifting from point of collection and moving to point of consumption um, to make sure um, that we're able to, um, to ensure that we're able to, um, sorry, <laughs> to ensure that uh, we're able to help students with an intervention that would benefit them the most. Second, we are enhancing our annual school monitoring program to better capture multiple uh, source utilization and also identify the specific needs of these schools, especially during the rainy and the dry season. And third uh, initiative that we're going to do is we're going to we're hoping to start a school reinvestment program. We're hoping to go back to the schools that we have already installed a rainwater tank system, and and bringing them a groundwater source so that they can. Uh, so that they can have a mix of rainwater and groundwater sources on premise, which would, which would be in line with the diversification of sources that they have on ground, but would also ensure that they don't face the challenges that they're seeing right now with seasonality. And lastly, we're extending guttering to increase the catchment areas. Uh, we've already started a pilot with 48 schools, and uh, we're hoping to see what changes uh, extending guttering could, guttering could bring with. Um, the amount of water that gets into the rainwater tank. And hopefully by the next conference, we'll be presenting the results for that. And um, lastly, I just wanna thank everybody and all my co-authors who have really helped us with the data collection and also our team back in Kenya, which is the regional service hub without which it would not have been possible. So thank you.
those statutes printed on time spent collecting water. Mm -hmm. Is that for school for students? And how do you sort of give them that all students are being asked to drink water for college? Um so that's a good question. So what we did is we did a focus group discussion with school staff members and we were uh, we asked them to list out all the water sources that they're uh, that they're using or they're asking students to bring water from. And uh, in most cases, we find we found that the teachers were actually going with the students to collect water to ensure their safety. So we asked them to um, give us an estimate of how, how much time it was taking them to do a round trip, including the queue time. Um, so, which is why it's it's not like it's not accurate data, but it was definitely an estimation of how much time they're spending out. And there was definitely a lot of sources out there that would take them an hour or more than an hour to go and fetch water from. So. Uh, these powerful data. So I hate to miss into it, but it seems that during school time, the time taken away to get water is usually not included in these assessments that we do in the communities too. So it's an interesting uh, challenge that we face. And the multiple use water is, is how do you maintain the quality of water and water harvesting and all of a sudden someone's bringing a bucket of water that they scooped up from the river on the way in. It's, it's incredibly challenging to, to, to do this. So it's commendable that you're starting this but having that source to sip like you met and take the thing is so important. But uh, so much daunting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we at the organization recognized that challenge as well. Uh, because at the moment we were chlorinating the rainwater tank systems, but we realized after the study that that might not be the solution, uh, especially if schools are using and filling even their filters with um, unprotected sources. Yeah. So we definitely asked them what was their approach in sending out students. Uh, we did not necessarily focus on gender, but some of the things that came out was that they would usually send um, this they would usually send a certain class, um, all of them, like they were associated with the task to go collect water. So I think sometimes classes would take turns. Um, like like in the morning, somebody is going and in the afternoon, somebody else is going. So there was definitely some <laughs> equity in the way that students were going and collecting water. But there was also a lot of resentment within the students about collecting water. So but there were definitely cases where we heard from teachers that students would pee in the buckets that they were supposed to collect water in because they did not like the fact that they were being sent out to collect water and they saw it as a sort as a way of punishment. Yeah. 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 Um, so the water project has a very elaborate OM operations in Western Kenya. We do have technicians and enumerators on field. So we do um we capture functionality on M waters anytime if if a school has an issue, they can report the issue to us using a phone call or anytime our numerators go and visit these schools to do the monitoring, uh, quarterly monitoring and they witness an issue, they can report that issue on M water and there would be someone who would go and fix the issue at the school. And that could include um, replacing the taps, improving the guttering or, um, or if there's any erosion around the rainwater tank itself. So all of those issues are usually worked uh, our enumerators and technicians work with the school on that. Um, and as for communities, um, so we do try to involve the communities um, during the implementation phase. So most of the tanks that are made, we ask the communities and the school to bring locally available material 
to build these tanks and that the process and the reason why we do that is so that they can have an ownership over the rainwater tank system. Um, but one challenge that we did identify with this uh, through the study was that um, because these communities are involved in the construction of these tanks, they do like they think that they kind of own the tank as well now. So they what they would do is like they um, sometimes try to collect water after school hours or would not talk with the school authorities before coming in, or they would sometimes even vandalize the rainwater tank systems if the schools prevent them from using the tanks. Yeah. But um, but our hope is that in the future that we, um, we're hoping that as an organization, we can actually install a community water point right next to a school water point so that there's not extra pressure on our school water points. Yep. Thank you. Great. Thank you to all of our presenters. That's the end of the session. I welcome you to join us in the lobby for our poster reception, which runs until six o'clock. Thank you.